So great to be back on stage. Um, I realize I'm in between you and lunch, which is quite an unenviable situation. I also understand that restaurants in Barcelona are only opening at 1 p.m., so I guess we still have a little bit of time together. Uh, mobile technology has really changed the way consumers live over the past 10 to 15 years. And that's why most of you as marketeers have to adapt to a mobile-first world. But today, I'm not here to talk about this. Today, I'm here to talk about something bigger, something which has the potential of changing the way we run marketing and advertising in the future forever. Some of you may have seen this. I don't know if you remember, it's uh, Pong. Uh, it's a game I used to play when I was young. I thought it was fascinating you know, to be able to hit a ball you know, on the screen here. I thought it was magic. The reason I'm showing this is because, uh, you know, fast forwarding to today, it reminds me of this game. It's called Breakout. And the reason I'm showing you this game is that one of the companies owned by Alphabet, DeepMind, is actually using Breakout to test some of their machine learning technology. And so I thought it would be really great to see the power of machine learning, to see how the computer is playing the game. So here, you see the computer trying to understand how to play the game. It knows it has to maximize the score, but as you can see on this picture, it's still making a lot of mistakes after 100 episodes of training, just 100. The very interesting thing is that after 400 games, you can see that it's playing it pretty well, probably better than I would have played, just 400 games. And the most fascinating thing is actually that after 600 games, which means pretty much overnight, it is playing like this. It's becoming super smart. It's figuring out it has to poke a hole in the wall so that the ball bounces back inside, and it's you know, maximizing the scores to a point where it's becoming the best player at breakout ever. And so what I'd like you to think about is a couple of things. Have you seen how fast the computer is moving? Have you seen how accurate the computer has been? And have you noticed that it's just been training and learning. So machine learning is actually able to do a lot of simple things much better than any human being on the planet. You could tell me, great, love it, PH, but this is just a game. How does it play in, you know, in real human life? Well, by now you may have uh, noticed I'm French. There's a little bit of an accent here. It's not Texan for sure. And I'm using a lot of Google Translate. Now, don't tell it outside of this room, but while I'm using Google Translate, I was not a great fan of it because it does a lot of things, but not quite right, until very recently, where I read that Google Translate had gotten a lot better. So here's what I did. I truly did it. Being French, I went to extract um, you know, one piece of Swan's Way, which has been written by Marcel Proust in the 19th uh, century. And the reason I did this is because this is probably the most complicated French novel you can find. Put it in translate, look for the translation. Guess what? It's a pretty perfect translation. So I, you know, this piqued my curiosity. I said, what happened? I went to read about it, and I figured that nine months ago, the Google AI team had contacted the Google Translate team, saying, you know what? We're suggesting that we're going to replace your statistical-based model by a machine learning algorithm that's going to learn from millions of iterations pick up the nuances, pick up the meaning of your sentences, and do a damn good job at translation. When the team flipped the switch, the improvements made were more than all the improvements made over the product history. I tell you what, every CEO in every company you represent would love and would kill for such results. Actually, the Google Translate director said, we would have achieved this only after 10 years. Nine months, 10 years. And so what is happening in Google Translate, I tell you, is happening in each and every industry you know, including the marketing and the advertising industry. Part of my job is to spend time with people like you to help them grow their business. And what I'm hearing is three things that are getting in the way. The number one thing is, you know, PH, how do I keep up? with the ever-changing consumer behavior. Consumers 
are becoming so demanding. They're fickle. And care of Amazon, a very nice colleague of ours, they want to try convenience. So how do I, as a CMO, really make sense out of the thousands of interactions that I have with each of those clients? Number two, how do I maximize the marketing dollars that I'm investing? How do I maximize this return? I'm dealing with so many media properties today. And you're telling me I need to reach every customer and truly understand how much to spend for each one of them? It's impossible. Third, and then when I'm done with all of this, what do I do to keep focusing on the right things? I'm overwhelmed. How do I play the role of strategic advisor to my CEO when I have to deal with all these platforms? I tell you what, we have to re-engineer the job of the CMO and make it a lot more effective. So with all of that, it's critical you understand that machine learning is having a deep and transformational impact on the marketing and advertising industry. And we'll see later on, but by embracing machine learning, every C CMO, every one of you, will be able to address those three fundamental challenges I've been talking about. And not only you're going to make your marketing smarter, you're going to make it a lot more efficient, but you're actually, we believe, you're going to save about 50% of the time that you're spending today trying to turn the knobs, and you're going to be able to really invest it in becoming the strategic advisor to your CEO, or, as Andrea has been saying, being involved in really understanding your consumers, really understanding their emotion, really connecting your brand, as a Sophie has been mentioning as well, truly understanding what they need. And so there are three things that I believe you can do to really leverage machine learning going forward. The number one thing is make your marketing smarter and more efficient. Automate and optimize, and we'll talk more about how to do that. Number one, number two, once you've done that, Get to know your audience. Get to know your customers very deeply. And third, focus on the right business outcome. Now, before we do that, I don't know how many of you are familiar with machine learning. Uh, probably some of you know it very well. But I thought we could really talk a little bit more about the technology for a few minutes, you know, to make sure that we are um, having a, a playing, uh, level playing field here. So machine learning is a subset of AI, and AI has been around for decades. In its simplest form, think about machine learning as a set of algorithms that are learnings from millions of examples or millions of data sets. And as it does, the computer gets better and better at recognizing very complex patterns out of data, out of text, out of video, out of images. That's the simplest form. If you think about Google Photo, some of you are using Google Photo, it's using machine learning. If you're thinking about Google Assistant, it's using machine learning. Why? Why? To recognize your voice, to really understand you know, the, the, the meaning of your sentence. There are three reasons why machine learning is happening just right now. The no number one is the availability of an exponential increase in power that is following Moore's law of doubling every about 16 to 18 months. In reality, it's really important to understand these graphic processing units, which have been sold, sold by Intel, by NVIDIA, by Google, which are allowing or enabling the type of massive parallel processing that is being used by machine learning. The number two thing which is really important to understand is the abundance of data. The fact that we have massive data sets available because of the internet, because you all are using your smartphone, is really important for machine learning. Machine learning doesn't really work without data. And last but not least, which is the secret sauce, is the availability or the evolution of neural networks. That's a little bit of the geeky part here. What is a neural network? So think about it. Think about your brain. 
It's millions of little computing units that are interconnected with each other and organized by layers. And the neural networks that it, as it learns is adapting the weights of the algorithm during the learning phase. And once it has learned, a large neural networks can really understand very complex patterns much, much better than any other human being on Earth. Let's look at this picture. There's a neural network on YouTube that allows you to recognize dogs. And I'll tell you why later. But when, you, when you're thinking about this, the very first layer of the neural network are trying to understand very specific characteristics of the image it's looking at. It's looking at edges or colors, very specific. The second layer is trying to infer from that whether or not it's looking at shapes, circles, rectangles, triangles. And as it moves up, it's conceptualizing even more. Are we looking at an animal or not? And the final layer is really figuring out, with all this data, the probability of, are we looking at a dog or not? Now, at this stage, I will just tell you something very, very deep. You think that this is machines, and so they just can learn, right? They just learn. That's all what they can do. Well, I'll be back maybe one day to tell you more about it, but I've seen a machine that is creating. Machine learning can create. Just think about it. It's the reverse process. And so we do have today a lot of algorithms where you say dog, and it creates a dog. The dog that the neural network knows how to create. So now that you're pretty much like all experts, or much better experts than many, many people on machine learning, I'd like to go back to how do you transform your marketing process based on this. So let's talk about becoming smarter and more efficient. Most of you recognize this process. By the way, I'm making sure that we're only talking here about demand marketing process. We're not talking about brand. We're not talking about you know, the high level of the funnel here, just the demand marketing process. And that's something that most of you have, be, have been using, you know, nothing new. In the past, very easy to manage. Very few customer touch points, very few media to deal with, very easy to keep under control. Today, not anymore. As I explained, thousands of customer uh, touch points lots of digital media properties to deal with, lots of handoffs. Almost impossible to control that process, even if you think you're controlling it. Except that machine learning allows you to simplify this process by automating and optimizing many parts of it, to the point where some of our advertisers are using this process, which is much simpler. So let me explain to you how it works. At first, you focus your time on really understanding your business objectives, not the middle of the funnel KPIs, the business objectives. Am I going to grow profits? Should I grow revenue? Am I going to acquire new customers? Something your CEO can understand. The second thing is that you're spending a lot of time, more time than you have ever spent on understanding your customers, understanding your audience, segmenting that audience. And once you've done this, you give all of this to a machine learning algorithm so that it goes on the web and look for similar prospects, similar audience that you're looking for. And at the outset, you're making sure that you're delivering against your business outcomes, the profit or the revenue. And you're also using what we call a multi-touch attribution platform which is basically a whole platform that allows you to do a couple of things. Number one, visualize where your customers have been along the purchase path. Second, figuring out of all the media you're using, what kind of performance are you getting? And finally, take actions, corrective actions, when required and if required. So you might tell me, like, well, that sounds like kind of interesting. I'm not so sure that this is happening right now. And I can tell you it's happening right now. There's much more progress to be made in that space. But it's going pretty fast. Let me give you a couple of examples then that, uh, of uh, what you can do. 
I'm struck sometimes that many marketeers are very, very uh, narrowly thinking about their audience. They're thinking demographics, sometimes psychographics. But in fact, we know so much more about our consumers. We know their intent. We know their behavior. We know content. We know a lot. And so what you can do today is take your corporate data, overlay Google signals on top of it, and as I've been saying, go on the web and look for similar audience, similar prospects. Actually, a company called Under Armour, which is a sports company, is doing exactly this. They're taking list of prospects coming on their website. They're combining this with list of customers they have and the highest profit, uh, profitable customers they have. And they're basically asking the machine to go look for similar prospects. They're also using affinity audiences, which means, like in their space, they're going after customers who've got similar interests, like sports enthusiasts. The bottom line here is that you can't do this manually. You can't. The machine does it for you, for you a lot better. And the beauty of machine learning, as I've shown it, is that by acquiring customers, the, the algorithm gets better. So you get better and better results. Another example of how to make your marketing smarter and more efficient is what I call smart bidding. Maybe a, you know, a foreign concept for some of you, so I'll try to explain it. But think about market here, the most important question you're asking yourself. It's probably, how much should I spend per customer interaction for each and every one consumer that I'm dealing with on a real time? And I tell you what, the answer is, it's impossible to figure out unless you're using machine learning. I'm going to show you why. The reason why is because this is one of your customers coming to your website, getting to your cart. Pretty easy. This is another customer who's gone on a video platform and then into your cart. Pretty easy, too. But the fact of the matter, and this is still a very simple <laughs> picture of it, all of these things happen at the same time. It's just impossible to figure out how much you should spend per customer, per interaction on real time, except that machine learning can. And so one algorithm, which is called smart bidding, does this by learning about the path, about category of customers on a real time, bidding you know, in an optimized way for each and every one of the customer that they find, depending on what is the return that you expect from that customer and where it is in the, you know, in the funnel. It does it so that it maximizes the return investment you have on your, on your customer. So it's a very, very powerful thing that are happening here, and it's called you know, the smart bidding algorithm. Let me talk to you about one company that is doing this very well. Uh, it's Wish. Wish is a leading mobile shopping advertiser. And what they are doing is that they've totally optimized and automated their targeting and bidding process so that they can spend more time on things that Andrea have been talking about. Well, the results are just amazing. After one year, they've been able to double the number of app install they've had, and have done it by increasing or making their efficiency a third better. Just stunning results. There's many other ways to make your marketing smarter and more efficient with machine learning but we don't have much time to talk about it. I'd like to switch then to, once you've done that, what can you do? And once again, you can save time so that you can learn about your audience a lot better. Now, when I'm talking to some CMOs, I'm realizing they're struggling to really find actionable and valuable insights from their audience. And the question again is why? Well. For many of you, solving for that is to look at your demographics and psychographics and pretty much solving for a two-dimensional Rubik's Cube. Not easy, but still feasible. Let me just tell you that I believe your picture, your real picture, is this one. This is the real picture. You're trying actually to solve for a multi-dimensional Rubik's Cube. And no one in this room can do that unless you're really an expert. Only machine learning can really make sense out of the millions of permutations that you know, this implies. So great, what do I do about this pH? Well, many of our advertisers today are using machine-powered systems, machine learning-powered systems called DeepCRM. And what this is, is 
It allows them to take their customer data, they're overlaying media signals on top of it, and they can ask a lot of tough questions from that machine learning algorithm, like, what are the three most critical behaviors displayed by my most relevant customers? How many of you do know the answer to this question? Very few, because it's a very multidimensional kind of question. Or are my app users more profitable than my non-app users? Or how do I align my discount to my product offering? And so on and so forth. The key point here for you to understand is that only machine learning can solve that problem for you. And if you use machine learning, you'll know your customers so deeply that you'll differentiate yourself. And again, I'm back to this point that Sophie and Andrew mentioned uh, you know, before me, that this gives you time to really understand how to connect emotionally to your audience. Now, let me talk about an example. So McDonald's Japan, who has had declining sales, and what they did is they took their uh, corporate data, their overlay media uh, signals from Google, and they had some amazing results. So more specifically, they figured out that a lot of their customers were using smartphones to figure where to go for lunch, how, wh where to go and, and grab a drink. And they also found from their product data that product was very much influenced, the purchase was very much influenced by weather conditions. So they said, great, we're going to take our you know, corporate data, we're going to overlay a lot of signals, including weather uh, conditions, and then we're going to serve ads based on what customers want. And so, for example, on a sunny summer day on the beach, they might say, well, look, let's make sure that people get what they need, like, for example, a Coke. Or during a, a week that is a kind of rainy, you know, maybe we should offer a different type of burgers to our customers. They designed 25,000 ads that they served in a very custom way, and they were able to really increase their coupon utilization by 50%. They tripled their click-through rate. So again, amazing results. Last but not least, focusing on the right business outcome. Well, what do, what do we mean by this? Aren't you focusing on the right business outcome? I think you probably think you are. But many of us are actually spending a lot of time in the middle of this matrix. That's what I call being faced with a maze of metrics. All of you and many of us, we know them. CPC, CPA, ROS, MOAS, impression share, click share. Oh, we know that. We love it, by the way. Machine learning allows you to refocus on the top of the pyramid. How about profits? How about revenues? How about customer acquisition? And so let me give you an example of a company that has done that very well. And they have achieved two major benefits. First, they're reconnecting marketing to what the company needs marketing to do. Really important. And the second thing is that they've been able to weed out marketing inefficiencies by focusing on what matters. The name of the company here is Autobytel. It's an automotive media company. They came to us and they said, we can't invest more. It's not possible. We've reached our CPA, the cost per acquisition, the famous cost per acquisition per customer. And we said, well, wait a minute. That's an average CPA, yes? Yes. What do you care about, CPA or profits? Oh, we care about profits. And so we looked at their customer data and we said, look, if you are able to define multiple CPAs depending on the profitability of the, your customers, would you be able to improve your profits? And we showed them that picture and said, absolutely, you could, which they did. The result is Autobytel was able, just by doing this, to increase their profits by 59%. And so my key takeaway here, it sounds like very simple. It happens all the time. Number one, focus on the right business outcome. Figure out with your CEO, with whoever, the business unit manager, what do we care about? Second, focus on the very few metrics that relate to that business outcome. And you know what? Automate the rest and get rid of all the other metrics. Because frankly, this is not where the value is. So, in summary, 
if you learn on how to make your marketing smarter and more efficient, if you truly focus on getting to know your audience, if you truly focus on the right business outcome, you'll be able to regain control of your marketing. And as I've been saying, spend time on becoming the strategic advisor to your CEO or spend time on really getting to know your customers and develop the art side of marketing. And to do that, you have to embrace machine learning in every part of your marketing process. Let me leave you with one practical thing you can do when you go back home, either on Wednesday, Thursday, or Monday morning. I love one thing that Jack Hollis, who is the CMO of Toyota, is doing. Jack is using a rule called the 70-20-10. What is this? 70% of his marketing dollars is investing in things that work. He does know that, and that's where it goes. 20% is invested in things that have been promising. And 10% is invested on things where he wants his team to completely innovate. He doesn't care about the ROI. Here's my ask. Go back home and ask whoever, yourself or your boss, could we use 10% of our marketing so that we're going to go test machine learning use cases, be it in targeting, be it in profiling your customer, be it in bidding, or personalizing your ads, or your attribution model. Everything is going to be operated by machine learning in the future. Don't let the next wave of technology to your competitors surf on it. Thank you. PH. So thank you. Uh, we have time for a couple questions, so I want to uh, wander. Great. Yeah. And if you could introduce yourself, that would be terrific. Hello, I'm uh, Matt Littonen from Endes Analysis, um, a TMT analysis firm in London. Um, um, very powerful message there in terms of uh, shifting to attribution uh, based on concrete business uh, metrics. Now, on that, uh, a problem of machine learning algorithms is that it's not always easy to see for humans uh, what the sort of decisions, what the decisioning looks like. It's hard to see the rules in terms that we understand. Now, even if you choose a business metric as the output, um, would it, there be a possible problem of transparency? For example, if you set a short attribution window for those business outcomes, would it be possible for something undesirable to happen on a grand scale before we get to the long-term business results? And would, would that possibly affect those? Thank you. So let me make sure I, I'm, I'm going to try to answer the, 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 the question, but I hope I'm getting it right. Uh, number one, um, what we're saying is not to trust machine learning and not know anything about the process. And so what I'd like you to think about is like, if you're a pilot of 70, 777, right, or 777, right, you're probably, you're aware of all the metrics, but you're spending your time on, because everything is automated, on two or three things that are really important. And the goal is to land the plane. But if there's a problem in the plane, you know, in, in flight, you're going to act on it. And so that's the role of the marketeer today, in my view, is to use this multi-touch attribution platform. And there's many in the market. It doesn't have to be Google or anybody else, but it's like there's many out there, are going to be so sophisticated in the future that you'll be able to visualize pretty much everything that is happening. So machine learning is not, don't confuse machine learning as with robots, right? Uh, that certainly does something that you don't necessarily want it to do. Um, I think that um, also part of your question was, you know, um, can some of the suggestion uh, have a negative impact? And then how do we uh, understand, you know, whether it's going to have a negative impact? Um, I think we've got to be careful. We've got to be careful about how we're using machine learning, how we're incorporating machine learning in every part of a process, whether it, it is the advertising or marketing process or anything that you're doing in your company. I mean, you know, we, Google, are spending enormous amount of time on this. And I think, you know, machine learning by itself is a, is a technology. It's an approach. But what matters is what the engineers want machine learning to uh, achieve. And so we do have like a ton of people like thinking about this, making sure that you know it's not like this thing that you keep hearing you know in the in the media that as soon as you do uh, or you develop a machine learning algorithm, it can, can 
take control of itself and do more later on. I mean, that might happen in the future, you know, but it is not about machine learning. Machine learning is really, think about it, it's more of a, the ability for a system to learn something that you want it to learn and doing it much better than any other human being. And that's my message to you. It's like in the marketing and advertising process, most of you in the next couple of years, you're going to be able to differentiate yourself from your competitors because you are going to use machine learning. And the one thing I want you to remember is that time counts. There's urgency here. Because if any of your competitors is using it today, and they're using the network effect of machine learning, you'll never be able to catch up. That is something that is really interesting and fascinating about machine learning. Because it keeps learning from you know, what it does for you. PH, let me, let me ask a, a variation, uh, kind of a more immediate variation on that question. I mean, one of the, in a multi-touch attribution modeling situation, especially one that's utilizing um, uh, just reams and reams and reams of real-time web data, interaction data, how do you make sure that you're not optimizing solely for short-term value? How do you make sure you're optimizing for long-term value and values? I mean, it's a classic marketing problem. It's, it's how do I make sure I don't um, sell today by underpricing myself when I can go for a longer-term, uh, uh, longer-term values that might take longer to pull off? How, That's how do you do a it? very good question. That's why, in my view, again, machine learning is going to solve that. Problem. You know, we see a lot of customers, again, looking at short term when we're asking them, like, what is really important to you? And they're like, well, yeah, lifetime value of my customer is really what matters to me, right? So if I could know this and I could bid based on the lifetime value of customers, for example, on a discrete way across my funnel, real time across all the countries, I solve the problem. And I do believe that this is where machine learning is going. It's solving big problems and making sure that it listens to what you want. Now, you could say, look, I want to solve for a short-term problem or I want to solve for a long-term problem. But the point I'm trying to make is that you can really, by thinking about the you know, business outcomes you want, you can yourself decide what you want your machine learning approach to be, either long-term or what, what is exactly, what does matter for your business. And I think it's going to solve one thing that many of you are probably today uh, dealing with which is the, the infamous question from your CEO, why should I invest in brand? Where is going to be the mm -hmm. return? When am I going to see it? And most of the customers I've known when I was at, well, I was at Dell. I was even asking my, my team, if I can't see the impact this quarter, I'm not going to be able to get the funding. And we all know that brand campaigns last for more than a quarter. So for a lot of performance marketeers, this is going to be an amazing field. Because now you're going to be able to tie everything together. And as I've been saying, the machine will do things you can't even dream about today. Is there a little bit of trust about what's going on in the machine? Yes, as there's trust in your, the, car, you know, the, the engine of your car to uh, start up every morning. But I do believe that this is where we're going. Unless you're taking the train today, you might be left in the dust in the future. Uh, time for one more question. Anybody? All right, I'll take the privilege. One more tough question. In a machine learning world, in an AI-driven world, what does a copywriter or a designer do all day? I think a lot. That's why I believe that my message is not at all that machine learning will do everything for you. I think, again, uh, I don't know if Andrea is still in the room or Sophie is still in the room. We do believe, I do believe, having been a CMO, that there's so much to be done around creativity, so much to be done in terms of connecting you know, with your consumers and driving the emotions, so much to be done on redefining your value proposition, your brand promise. I tell you what, on, uh, uh, for example, on YouTube and many video platforms, the brands that win are the brands who do understand their customer, the brands that are able to relate to their consumers. It's not like the ad itself. It's like the ad is the, you know, the conclusion, the outcome of all the creative work that is happening before. And so why not leaving yourself all the time possible to do this? Why 
leaving to machine learning algorithms everything that you think can be automated and not believing in the fact that, oh, if I stay in control, I can do a lot better. Because what? You will not beat the machine learning algorithm of breakout, ever. You will not. You think you are, but you will not. And that, that's been my biggest learning as I've been studying machine learning for the past two years. We think we're in control. <laughs> we're not. That's great. Paul-Henri Ferrand, thank you, PH. That's fantastic. <laughs>